Good morning. And welcome to worship as we gather on a crisp but yet sunny, calm Sunday morning as God's people in this place. I've been remarking as I've been watching some of the Olympics with my wife, the spectacle of when the world puts on a show and just how different it is when we come to church. There's no fireworks, no great pageantry, no matching uniforms, and yet we recognize even though there's no spectacle, that in this place the most powerful being in the universe is moving among us. And it's hard for us to imagine that. Maybe this morning, if you've had a difficult week, it's hard to experience that. But that is why we gather, because we gather in the presence of a living God. This morning, we will uh, worship that God and just want to highlight a couple of ways that he will meet with us in this week. Tonight, we'll be gathering again at 6 p.m. and we're going to gather on the table for a celebration of the Lord's Supper. If you are a believer in Christ, this is one of the ways that God nourishes us, not just reminds us, but actually nourishes us with his presence. Tonight we're also going to be blessed with the presence of a choir from the area Christian school. The Unity Night Sounds will be here and be, as we feast in God's grace, we'll also feast in music this evening. I want to invite you all back at 6 p.m. Also, this is the beginning of the Lenten season, and on Wednesday, Lent begins with an Ash Wednesday service here at Bethel. That'll be at 7 p.m., so a little bit later, 7 p.m., and we're going to gather, hear God's word. We're going to also, for those who would like, receive the sign of ash and the shape of a cross on our forehead And here, the invitation to consider ourselves dead to sin, but alive in Jesus Christ. And that also is our prayer service. We're going to be giving the needs of our lives, our communities, and this world to God as we recognize our humility and our need for God in prayer. A couple other things I just want to remind us of as we enter into this week. Uh, There's a thousand-man march on Tuesday at 7 p.m., beginning at the home building behind Culver's. That's for men to simply walk through this community to pray over it and then to gather for a worship service at Dort afterwards. They're hoping for 500 college students, 500 men from the community. Just want to remind you that that's an option this Tuesday at 7 p.m. Um, and so again, with those things before us, I guess just to quiet our hearts in a week of many spectacles and just ask in the simplicity of this space for us to realize that God is present. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we live in a world that seems so solid and real, and at times our faith seems like the echo of a different story. Heavenly Father, we pray that that echo would grow louder in our hearts this morning, that we could hear the music of heaven even on the shores of earth. Heavenly Father, we praise you that in a world that begins to speak about love as they approach Valentine's Day on Wednesday, that you remind us of a deeper love, a love not shown through roses and chocolates and cheap jewelry, but poured out through the blood of your Son on the cross. And Heavenly Father, as we walk this different road in a different world that you are remaking, we pray that you would meet with us today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for each person who is able to gather in the sanctuary, for those who are listening on the internet, or radio, or in television. We just thank you that you are with each of your people, that you know us by name, and that we are yours. So Father, receive our worship and our praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, would you please stand for our call to worship?
happens. That song is an invitation to experience all of life, not just on a Sunday morning, is this entry into a different story where God is present and is remaking the world around us. And as he does that, receive this greeting. To God's elect strangers in the world, who've been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, through obedience to Jesus Christ, grace, mercy, and peace be to each of you, now and forevermore. Amen. As God's people gathered in this place this morning, would you please turn and greet those around you, especially guests with us today. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Forgive all our sins 
and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Shall we pray? Lord, we confess this week that we have given more weight to our success and our happiness than to your will. We have spoken without listening or even an attempt to understand. We have remained silent rather than speaking the truth. We have judged. We've been reluctant to love our neighbor, and our actions have been dictated by our opinions and prejudices rather than by your commands. Forgive these and all of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. While the Lord used the prophet Hosea to call his people to repentance, he also used Hosea to remind his people of his blessing. Hear these words of assurance. I will heal your waywardness and love you freely, for my anger has turned away from you. I will answer you and care for you, and your fruitfulness will come from me. The ways of the Lord are right, and the righteousness walk in them. Together we receive this blessing and ask for the Spirit's guidance, singing, For freedom Christ has set us free.
shall not steal. We will do what we can for our neighbor's good and work faithfully so that we may share with the poor. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. We will speak the truth with our neighbor in love, render judgments that are true and may they release, and not devise in our hearts any evil against anyone. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. We will be content whatever the circumstances through the strength of Christ within us. Thus we must love our neighbor as ourselves. For the Lord requires of us to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. song we've just sung is based on a chapter in the scriptures, Galatians chapter 5, and I invite you to turn with me to that passage of scripture this morning. Galatians 5, that's found on page 1080 in our pew Bibles, and we're going to be this morning verses 13 through 26 in that chapter. We have, as a congregation, been in a series in the Psalms, and we've just finished that last Sunday, finished listening to the melody of the Psalms, and now we turn our ears to the music of Holy Week as we enter into the season of Lent. For those who aren't familiar with the church rhythm, this ancient rhythm that we call Lent, it's a period of 40 days, not counting the six Sundays. So 46 days between Ash Wednesday and then the dawn of Easter morning. And it's a time when historically God's people have been invited to come with confession, repentance, penance, humility. But more than self-examination, it's also a time to reflect on the cross and what Christ has done So that when we enter again into that Easter Sunday morning, we will have not just grown in our love for Christ, but in our likeness of him. We would not just have remembered the cross, but we will have experienced with Christ what it is to take up our cross daily as we follow him there. That's the season of Lent. And as we do that this year, we're going to journey through Lent by journeying through Galatians chapter 5 and something called the fruit of the Spirit. These nine characteristics, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, that together make up the character of those who know God. And we're going to be studying each of these nine. We're studying the base this morning, and then we're going to study each of the nine in succession because together these show us how we are to live as followers of Jesus Christ. And this is a foundational text for all who would wish to do that. Tim Keller says this about our text this morning. To me, this is one of the clearest and most important and crucial passages in the Bible to understand the Christian life. You can't understand the Christian life if you don't understand this. So we're going to spend this Lenten season seeking to understand what is the fruit of the Spirit and how, as brothers and sisters in Christ, can we live with that fruit in our lives together. And with that before us, I'd like to invite us just to bow our heads and invite the Holy Spirit, to speak. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we hear now about the fruit of the Spirit. And yet we know that we cannot understand this fruit of the Spirit or express it without your Spirit's illumination of your word in our hearts. Holy Spirit, you who brooded over the waters of creation, forming all the life that there is, We pray that once again you would move through this place and that you would form the life of Christ in us. Heavenly Father, that you would pour out your gifts of the Spirit on this body, that you would, through the Spirit, show us Jesus, our faithful Savior, and that through that same Spirit you would bear this fruit and move us in this world in your mission. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. 
If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we're going to spend this Sunday in this Lenten season looking at the fruit of the Spirit. And I'm aware that this list can seem a little abstract, maybe a little overly spiritual for our lives. And so I want to begin by sharing two events this week that God gave that centered me as I reflected on these texts in the lives that we lead. The first of those events was at the very beginning of the week. Monday morning, I took a member of this congregation to a radiation treatment in Sioux Falls. It was early, we left about 7.30 in the morning, it was that snowstorm on Monday, so we kind of made our way slowly there, dropped him off. And then while he was receiving the treatment, I sat in the waiting room of the cancer hospital at Avera. And I had brought a book with me on the fruit of the Spirit to begin preparations for this sermon in this series. But I didn't have any paper with me, and so I asked the receptionist if she would give me some paper. She did, and I was busy taking notes And then about 30 minutes in, I just suddenly stepped back and realized I was taking notes on the fruit of the Spirit in a cancer hospital, writing that on stationery from a cancer institute. And it struck me in that moment, not the knowledge of this, but what does this actually mean in a place like that? What does it mean to experience the fruit of joy when you are facing your own death? What does it mean to experience the fruit of peace when you are filled with anxiety waiting for the PET scan result? What does it mean to be filled with patience when you are in the waiting room for the fifth day in so many days? What does it mean to experience the gift of self-control when you can't stop yourself from vomiting before your next chemo treatment? What does the fruit of the Spirit mean in a cancer ward? How do you experience and express the fruit of the Spirit there? The second event that grounded me as I thought about this was at the end of the week. On Friday, I was talking to Aaron Bart, who's a chaplain of one of the area Christian colleges here. He's doing a series this spring on why young people leave the church. And as part of that, he did a study of the students at that college, just seeing some understandings that they had about church, and he was gracious enough to share those results with me. Now, some of that was he asked them, what's one word that describes church? And there was a lot of words, and I was scanning over those words But a number kept occurring and they jumped out at me. People described church as fake. They described it as judgmental, as boring. When I read those descriptions of church, that made me sad. Because it means clearly none of the students who go to Bethel go to chapel. Because they wouldn't describe church that way. But then there was something in the study that encouraged me. He also asked those same students, what is the one thing you most want to happen before you hit the age of 30? What's the one thing you most desire? And the, the third highest thing on that list, there was a number of things, but the third highest was people desired to get married. I think it would have been a little higher, but most of them already are married. So the second highest thing that people had, if they picked one thing they want to do before 30, was to start a career, very understandable, especially it shows that there are parents who go to chapel. They want that for their kids. But the number one thing that students in this area of Christian college desire before they're 30 was to become more spiritually mature. Now, the way we describe maturity in the Christian faith is actually to become like God, nothing less. 
And we become like God as we express the fruit of God's life in us, which is the fruit of the Spirit. So you could say the number one thing that some of these college students want in this next decade of their life is to express and exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. But again, I thought, what does that mean? How do you grow in the fruit of love in a culture of hate? How do you grow in the fruit of joy and peace in a culture of Prozac and depression and anxiety? How do you grow in patience in a culture of instant gratification? How do you grow in self-control in a culture of self-indulgence? Again, what does this mean? How do we exhibit and express the fruit of the Spirit in a cancer ward, as a college student, or anything in between? And with those grounding questions, we turn to this very familiar passage, very key passage of Scripture of Galatians chapter 5. Now, if you're not familiar with this letter, remember all these things weren't weren't written as books, they were written as letters. This is a letter to a church in a town called Galatia. And throughout this letter, Paul is hammering home one theme. What he's really trying to to understand through this whole letter is that their belief is more basic than their behavior. That their faith in Jesus is, is more foundational than their obedience to laws about Jesus. One of my seminary professors said the whole point of Galatians is Paul trying to say in an inversion of our normal saying, don't just do something, stand there. Don't just do something, trying to save yourself, stand there. Galatians 2 verse 16 is the theme verse. A person is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus. Jesus Christ. That's, this, that's the book. And yet what's remarkable is at the end of the book, Paul pivots. And after a book of saying, don't think you're saved by doing something, at the end, if you notice chapter 6, it's doing good. After a book of saying, don't do something, stand there, he ends with, don't stand there, do something. In fact, if you look at the passage we read this morning, the first verse of it, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature, but what? To serve one another. Chapter 6, verse 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. And so you might read this book and say, how do you fit those two things together? How can it be not what we do, but what's done for us, and then also be what we have to do? And the answer is, Paul is, in this book, answering two different problems. The first half of the book really is addressing the problem where they mistook their fruit for their root. They thought what they did was more important than why they were able to do it. But the second half of the book is dealing with a different problem, and that's that they've forgotten that our fruit reflects our root. That if we are saved, we will bear fruit. The fruit reflects the root. That's the point of the second half of this book, and that's what chapter five brings us to. But that's where the problem arises. Because Paul says that in each of our hearts, in each human heart that's a Christian, there are actually two different roots. So we might say, what kind of fruit do I have to bear? How do I bear the fruit of the Spirit? Well, Paul says you have to realize that in your heart and in my heart, there are two different roots that are both active, both bearing fruit. Verse 16 names those two roots. So I say, live by the Spirit, that's root number one, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature, or in some of your versions, the flesh. Root number two, these two living forces, God living within us, sin living within us. And those two forces are in opposition to each other. Verse 17a, for the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are against each other, and then he goes on to say that struggle. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. What does it mean to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit? Well, the fruit reflects the root, but the problem is we eat. reflects the root. Now I've completely lost my, uh, <coughs> so, so the, the problem is, again, um, 
which route are you going to choose? And the reality is each of those routes will express something differently in your life. Thank you, Mike. Now am I on? Yes. Man, it's just, it's one of those mornings when I was walking here, I stepped through the snow because I didn't shovel it all, and then I had these cuffs and they got snow stuck in them. Just that kind of a morning. <laughs> these two roots will express two different kinds of fruit. And so he describes the fruit of that first root of the sinful nature in verses 19 through 21. Notice this. The next, next slide. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. And then he lists 15 things. Sexual morality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, all of these sins. This is really a description of human life apart from God, or it's a Wikipedia entry from a plot summary of Game of Thrones. But this is, this is what that root within every Christian produces. And this list is not exhaustive, it's illustrative. He adds, and the like. There are many other ways that this root of sin living within us bears an ugly, bitter fruit. But then he says the other root bears a different kind of fruit. Verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Again, nine descriptors of a different way of living. And the problem in the church in Galatia is they had not just mistaken their fruit for their root, thinking their behaviors were all that mattered, but they also were feeding the wrong root. And the sign of that was the fruit that they were bearing as a community was not the sign of feeding and cultivating the life of God within them, but that in their legalism they were feeding the other life of sin within them. So notice how he frames our passage this morning. In verse um, 15, if you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will destroy each other. That was the fruit of their lives. And then the last verse of this passage, the other frame, verse 26, let us now become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Scholars say that's because that's what they were doing. Their lives were bearing a fruit because they were feeding the wrong root. So we begin this journey of Lent. And it's appropriate to ask the question, what root are you feeding? It's appropriate to ask that because tonight we will gather for the Lord's Supper and the church has always invited us to come to this table by examining ourselves. And Lent is that larger process of penance and repentance and confession and self-examination. And the question today is, what root are you feeding? What root am I feeding? And the way you'll know the answer to that question is, what fruit are you seeing? What fruit are you seeing in your life? And if we look at the list of those bitter fruits from the sinful nature, some of us might recognize those fruits in our own lives. Notice the first three. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery. That word sexual immorality is the Greek word porneia from which we get porn. Just this week, Wednesday, I read an article in the New York Times. This is the headline. What teenagers are learning from online porn. It's saying that in our culture today, Teens are engaging in porn more than 10 times more often than their parents assume that they are. In fact, in another study I read just a couple of weeks, a couple of months ago, in the end of 2016, they looked at just one of the popular porn sites, and they found that we watched in 2016, which is the last time they had full data, we watched four and a half billion hours of porn on one website. It's over 500,000 years. That for just a two-year period, human beings spent a million years watching porn. A million years. Why? Because there is a root living within us. And that's in the world around us, and we know the sinful nature is there, but the problem is that same root continues to live in everyone here. And I had a couple of conversations this week dealing with this issue. Not out there, but in here and in our churches, and in our lives. What root is operative in your life? What are you feeding? Look at the fruit. How about the next set of things in the list? 
idolatry and witchcraft. Now we might think that's something we don't see, and yet if you have eyes to see, you can look and witness in our world. How many watch the opening ceremonies to the Olympics? Anyone? Let's all do a yawn. <sighs> you say, church is boring. Crazy stuff, those openings. When I was watching it with my wife, they were doing dances, and in those dances, they were exhibiting a honoring of yin and yang, or yin and yang, which my New Age warlock uncle loves to speak about because those are two spiritual bodies. And in this opening ceremonies, we have literally ancient idols being brought out for our viewing pleasure. But that's not the only kind of idolatry in our world, although it's real and there are real spiritual forces. There's another kind of idolatry. The idolatry of self-glory. The idolatry of the flag of the nation. The idolatry of product placement and materialism. The way that we think that if we can achieve a certain thing, then we'll earn a certain value for ourselves. The idolatry of sports is just as real is the idolatry of spirits. What fruit do we see in our lives? What is the root? How about the next things on the list? Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage. Again, let's examine ourselves. Is there anyone in this community that you hate? Any name that comes to mind that fills you with hatred? Not hatred for the sin, but even hatred for the person. Do you ever find yourself in these days filled with fits of rage? Do we have in this community factions and dissensions? Are we finding ourselves trying to find people who like us and agree with us and against those who don't? Are we doing that? Are there fruit in our lives that show that we are feeding the wrong root? And the truth is, if the answer is yes, that battle will never go away this side of heaven. One scholar says this, So long as we remain in this present life, we never outgrow or transcend the spiritual conflict Paul was describing in this passage. There is no spiritual technique that can propel the believer onto a higher plane of Christian living where this battle must no longer be fought. Until we die, we have those two roots within us, a living God and living sin, and both are trying to bear fruit, and our battle must be every day the struggle of which one of those will we feed and which one will we not. And that is the Christian life. So we look at the fruit of the Spirit and we say, what does this mean in a cancer ward or in a college or anywhere in between? I think Paul would say if we would like to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, there are two things that God would call us and then empower us to do. Two things. The first of those is negative, the second is positive. In the negative, if we would have the fruit of the Spirit, we need to actually fight against the other root. Verse 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. The language of crucifixion is radical language. That root of sin in us is not something that we play with or leave to itself. It's something we must daily, this is an ongoing thing, we must daily put to death. That's not just here in Galatians. That's also in, for example, Colossians 3. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature or sinful nature, And then a list very much like this. If you would exhibit the fruit of the Spirit in your life, if I would, before we can exhibit life, we must put to death what fights against it. That's why in Lent, for many centuries, Christians have realized one of the ways we journey to the cross, one of the ways we experience Jesus' crucifixion, is by little by little putting to death with God's help those things in our own hearts that bear bad fruit. That's why some of us will fast from food beginning on Wednesday. Not because food is evil, but because it has had a place in our life, or maybe our approach to it has not been healthy, and it's been bearing fruit of addiction or of shame. And by stepping away from certain kinds of food, that's a reminder of our crucifixion of that sinful nature so that a new life of God can be expressed. Some of us, maybe this Lent, will give up social media, or maybe Netflix, Or something in our life that maybe it may not be bad, maybe it is, but it is feeding the wrong root. And the fruit we see of that thing in our life is not God honoring. Crucify the sinful nature. But remember, we crucify it as those who belong to Christ. Our behavior results from our belonging. It's not like any of those things you will do for Lent, any of the things you will fast or give up, do not earn you favor with God or salvation. 
We don't behave in order to someday maybe belong. We be already belong to Jesus. And that is why we can behave by crucifying the sinful nature. It's the first thing we do. We need to cut off, crucify. But then in the positive, the next verse tells us what we need to cultivate. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. It's not enough just to give up something. We also need to cultivate and take on something. Not enough simply to try to remove one root, but to feed the other. And how do you feed the life of God within us? We walk our lives with that God. This is what we see all through this text, verse 16. So I say live by the Spirit, verse 18. Led by the Spirit, verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit results from a journey with the Spirit. So in closing, how do we do this? What does this look like? Well, I want to remind us as we begin this series, and we're going to look at each of the fruit in succession, firstly, that these fruits have their origin in God and through a living relationship with Him. That the fruit that we're going to bear is not something that we can manufacture. It's something that's it's not the fruit of spiritual Christians. It's the fruit of God Himself, the fruit of the Spirit. And the way we have that life within us is by being united to the life of God. John 15, 5. I am the vine, says Jesus. You are the branches. If someone remains in me and I in them, they will bear much fruit apart from me. You can do nothing. The fruit comes from God in a relationship with God. And the second thing is this, that the fruit of the Spirit is the character of God that's formed progressively and inevitably by the Holy Spirit. Do you notice the fruit of the Spirit, is that singular or plural? Anyone? Singular. It's not the fruits of the Spirit. It's not like you can say, well, I'm really trying to develop uh, patience, but self-control, that's not my gift. This comes as a package. There is one fruit because there is one God that we image. One scholar says this, there is one fruit of the Spirit that manifests itself in nine Christian graces. Each one of the nine qualities flows into one another, mutually enriching and reinforcing the process of sanctification in the life of the believer. Paul deliberately contrasted the fruit singular of the Spirit with the works plural of the flesh. Whereas the latter are contrived and manufactured out of the old sinful nature, the former results from God's supernatural reshaping and transforming of human life. We're going to study each of these nine. But the way that we exhibit them, whether in a cancer ward or in college or anywhere in between, is by with the power of Christ and belonging to Him, crucifying the sinful nature. And by the power of Christ and belonging to Him, walking with the Spirit and living with Him so that His life flows through us, His fruit is expressed by us. This is the journey we are on, and as we study each of these fruits, may God's Spirit, who is alive in us, make them visible to this world. Friends, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank You that You are a God who pours out Your Spirit on men and women, the old and the young. And we thank you for the gifts of that Spirit. We thank you for experiences of your Spirit, for manifestations of your power in healing and in the voice of guidance in our lives. And yet more than these things, we thank you for the deep and quiet gift of the fruit of your Spirit, the forming of the character of Christ within each of us. Heavenly Father, as we journey through Lent, through this journey, through the fruit that you give, May you challenge us. May you show us how you are alive in our lives so that we could begin to experience the life of Christ in fresh ways as individuals and as a congregation. Father, we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. And all of us say, Amen. We live this life through the Spirit, and so our song response reminds us of that. Let's stand to sing together, Holy Spirit, living breath of God.
You may be seated. We come to this God in prayer, and one of the gifts of the Spirit is that he helps intercede for us, perfecting even those things we can't put into words so that God hears our hearts. One of the things we want to pray for this morning is Harold Vandekeef, who had been failing, passed away this morning at about 7 a.m. And so we want to pray for Kathy and the family. They were gathered on Harold this morning and uh, had just a time to pray with them. Harold went peacefully, and we're thankful that Harold is home, and yet we want to pray in this journey through grief for God's nearness with them. With those things before us, would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the call and the grace to daily put to death all that is against you in our hearts, to crucify the sinful nature with its passions and desires. And yet, Father, we also thank you that by that same power at work within us and because we belong to Jesus, you also call us to walk with the Spirit, not just to crucify what is evil, but to cultivate your life within us, to seek out ways in this Lenten season, maybe new disciplines that you would have us pick up, expressions of your grace as we intentionally read your word, as we pray together with one another, as you invite us into new ways of living and moving and seeing new fruit as your life is expressed in and through us, your children. Heavenly Father, we're thankful as a church that you are a God who has bought your church globally with your shed blood. That we gather with brothers and sisters, not just here in this community of Sioux Center, but with brothers and sisters around the world from every tribe and nation and tongue, gathered by the same Holy Spirit, sealed in one baptism, and together exhibiting the fruit of your Spirit in lives around the world that point to Jesus, the Savior of the world. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you are a God at work in our community. As we prepare to host one of our Christian high schools this evening, we're reminded of the gift of education, the quality schools in this community, and especially the gift that Christian education provides to teachers to name the hope within them and all that they show their students in your world. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you are a God who nourishes us, a God who gives us the fellowship of believers as imperfect as this fellowship is, as often as we do exhibit the fruit of dissension and faction and anger, yet a body that you are redeeming and that you have died for and that you live among. So, Heavenly Father, we pray for the other churches of our community. We pray for those who will join in this thousand-man march on Tuesday evening, for this expression for men of the unity of Christ's body as we pray for this community, as we worship beside one another. Father, we're thankful for Ash Wednesday as we also will gather with churches around the world and begin together this journey towards the cross, this intentional reflection on what you have done for us in Jesus' death and resurrection. Heavenly Father, we do continue to pray for this world. We pray for the conflict that's now beginning again in Syria and Israel. We just pray that you would restrain the forces of evil and destruction Lord, that you would bring in that place a sense for the leaders there of what the next step should be. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for our nation, for the leaders here, that you would give in a time of great polarization and great fear, that you provide wisdom for our president, for our Congress, for our courts, for our governor and legislators, for city leaders here. Lord, that each of the women and men who serve would be reminded of the weight of their office and also of your gift of leading for their, their office. Heavenly Father, as a congregation, we lift up before you all the ways that we are broken by sin and by a broken world. We pray especially this morning for those, again, who continue to suffer the effects of abuse, whether recent or many years ago, whether stories that we as a community have heard or others that have not been heard. But we pray that each of us who struggle with this weight would experience you lifting us from the shadows of shame into the brightness of those who belong to the Spirit and have your life within us. Heavenly Father, we pray for justice, for healing, for protection, for your presence. Gracious God, we continue to pray for El Meninga, thanking you that he could finish his radiation treatments in this week and yet also laying his life before you, praying that you would continue to guard him, or that you continue to give him fruitfulness as he ministers to his family and to so many others, even in the season of his life. Father, we thank you with John and Cheryl Hoagland for a good report on his heart. 
And yet we wait with them for this coming Tuesday and a report of results from a PET scan and other tests. Father, we do pray for peace as we wait, this fruit of the Spirit, but also if it's your will for good news. Father, we lift and commend John into your hands. We do also continue to pray for Herm Brenneman and his journey with cancer. We pray for others who have gone through journeys this uh, past several months and are still looking to you. We just pray that you continue to give them peace and health. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for others among us who are dealing with physical ailments. We pray with Devin and Sarah as Devin goes into open heart surgery on Tuesday. May you guard his life, guide the hands of the surgeons, use this for his blessing. Father, continue to bring healing also to Jim Vermeer and to Mike Moss from their recent heart procedures. Continue to lift up Kada as she recovers from her tonsil removal and others who are recovering from knee surgeries and broken wrists and all the ways that we have looked to you in these past weeks. Heavenly Father, we do continue to pray for those who struggle with the flu and the colds. That you would even bring healing to this part of our broken world. And Father, especially we lift up today those of us who are experiencing the pain of grief. We pray especially for Kathy and Vandeke, for her daughter Wanda, her whole family, for the extended family as they grieve the loss this morning of Harold. Lord, we thank you for his life, for his testimony. We thank you that we have seen in his life the fruit of the Spirit. And we thank you that now he is experiencing the wonder of fellowship with you as he sees you face to face this morning for the first time. Heavenly Father, may you receive him and may you receive our lives in all the ways that we serve you in this week. May you give us wisdom and humility as we study, as we work on our farms or in offices, as we raise families. Lord, in all the ways that you've empowered us to build your kingdom, we pray that you would use us. Use also our gifts and our offerings that we offer now in faith and in trust and in gratitude as signs of your work in us and through us. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Bring our gifts and our offerings, the first for the ministries of this congregation and denomination, the second for Christian education. Again, as we are, we will be gifted with music, the song, Let Them See You in Me, the fruit of the Spirit shown to the world.
invite you all back here uh, at 6 p.m. tonight for our service where we'll have the Unity Night Sounds lead us chorally and also gather around the communion table. Also, I invite you back on Wednesday for our Ash Wednesday annual prayer day service at 7 p.m. And as we enter this Lenten season together, we pray that we can enjoy these times of worship as God continues to meet with us, his people. With that, would you please uh, rise as the music begins. Our closing song is, May the Mind of Christ our Savior. Remember, the fruit of the Spirit is the life and uh, mind of Christ formed in us. We'll sing stanzas one through three, receive God's blessing, and then sing stanzas four and five. Please again stand as the music begins. Brothers and sisters, as you leave this place into a new week of service, would you go with God's blessing, this blessing. May the God of peace sanctify you through him through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who called you is faithful, and he will do it. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.